It's really such a pleasure to have Lauren Laverne here. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Uh, and uh, it, it's actually become quite an illustrious little seat, this, because uh, Maxine Peake was here last year, and the year before there was Jesse Norman, I think Cherie Blair was the year before, etc. So we only choose, you know, absolutely excellent women. <laughs> um, and there are two this afternoon who are going to talk. And we, we you know, a the, 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 lot of you have just been mentored or been mentored, been mentoring, or whatever. And uh, so we just started a conversation, really. Yes, we've started the interview already. Backstage. Uh, backstage. Didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> so much to talk about. <laughs> about um, really, what was the thing that started you off in your own head when you were very young, right? Thinking that you had a hope or an idea or an ambition to do something. I mean, what was the thing that you first imagined that you might do when you had little dreams as a young girl? Well, um, I always thought that I would go to university and become an academic, like, like my dad. Um, that was what my dad did. That's what he, he does. And so I always assumed that would be what happened uh, to me. And I went to a very strict convent school when I was a teenager. And so therefore, my mum and dad had this very kind of like musical, liberal intellectual family. My mum and dad were uh, council house, uh, council estate kids who had gone to um, grammar school. So I had a very loving working class in terms of culture, uh, family, very musical household. And uh, I loved music. And because I had this very strict kind of school that I was going to, my mum and dad, as a reward really for working hard at school, indulged my love of music and they kind of really supported me. And, and also because it was something that, you know, they loved themselves. Um, and that was supposed to actually be a distraction. And then weirdly, that just kind of accidentally became the thing that I did. So I was supposed to go to school and get all the qualifications, then do A-levels and then go to university. But then actually, when I was 16, what happened was I formed a band with my school friends, my two friends at school. <laughs> the only ones, you mean? Only got the two, so <laughs> you'd better be in the band. And we, you know, we were the only girls who liked music in our uh, school that I really knew about. We started a band and um, we were picked up. John Peel played us on the radio and then uh, we ended up signing to EMI and, and moving down to London and, and then I fell into doing what I do now, really. So, well, that's simple. <laughs> but was it really that simple that you, you formed a band and you were picked? I mean, you must have... Did you ever think, oh, God, you know, that's going to be an unusual decision to form a band and not go to university and not do what, not do what my parents and my, my nuns at school expected me to do? Well, it's funny because I think in a weird way, I have kind of retraced my parents' journey. You know, my dad and my mum and dad grew up in very large um, families. My mum's one of nine, my dad's one of six. And they both grew up on, as I said, uh, tough council estates, which were, in those days were actually, you know, um, really safe and lovely places to live, but no, not much money. Um, and then because of their journey through grammar school and into a kind of professional life, you know, they, I mean, my dad's written about it. My dad wrote an article for, I think, the Times Higher about his experience of, you know, his dad was a minor and feeling like sep dif different, having just a different experience. And it's been strange because in recent years, as my career has taken off a lot more, uh, it's occurred to me that actually in a strange way, I'm kind of recreating their journey, although it's into this kind of, weird media world which is just mad but you know kind of away from that that you know you mean you're not you're not taking the path that was expected of you i'm not just doing you know, something replicating different. that kind of uh middle class household I'm, I'm i'm doing something different and when you formed a band at 16 and you were signed up i mean there weren't then and there still are very few girl bands i mean we just had a look at all the statistics for all the fest music festivals this summer oh yeah the reading poster with all the yeah and you know yeah. take away seven bands that that's all i think there were seven bands that were girls women and the rest of it all blokes so i mean it couldn't have been a great climate then either could it uh no it was a very misogynistic um music scene and uh, unfortunately it still is i mean i, I hosted a q a three weeks ago at the Sixth Music Festival in Newcastle with two female musicians and one of them, Beth Jean Houghton, who is uh, from 
um, Newcastle, she, we were talking about, uh, I was saying, you know, when I was 16 and I was in a band, people used to say to us, who writes your songs for you? Like, just genuinely. And someone had said it, to, I was like, it's, it's better than that now, isn't it? And she was like, no, no, someone said it to me yesterday. And I was just so pissed off and kind of sad, you know, that, that it's still, people are still coming up against the same things. I, I tweeted that bill, you know, that picture of the Reading bill with um, all of the mail acts, all mail acts removed. And rightly, it was retweeted and a lot of people uh, talked about that. Um, I think it's unfair to, in some ways, to pick on Reading because I think it's a structural problem yeah. in the music industry. You know, they're, they're part of that, but it's not like it's their fault. They're at the other end of that. I think there's, there's structural inequality in the music industry and in the media. Uh, and that's the problem, really. It's not, you know, the people who are booking a festival and picking from the artists that are currently working and currently around. You know, they've got, they've got a, a hard job to do. It's kind of like back here somewhere, this problem. And this is where we've got to, you know, get girls making music and get them represented and, and get them into music. You know, that when I was growing up, there was, there was a guy in a record shop who would not sell me albums because he didn't want to waste them on a girl, you know? And... And, it's, and I, I just thought, like, that's weird. And then, you know, later on, I started to think, because I just went back when he wasn't in, when he wasn't on shift. But then I got older and I sort of started to think, well, what about the people who never went back? What, where were they? And, you know, I often sit with, like, my friends who are... Sometimes, you know, it, you, you might be used as an example of, oh, well, there can't be a kind of structural problem because, you know, look at people like Catelyn Moran and Lauren Laverne, and they've, they've done what they've done, and... But there should be, there's loads of us. I know loads of people that are like me and Kathleen. Why are, why are we the ones on stage? You know, there should be more of us here. And that's because there is structural inequality yeah. that needs to be addressed. I mean, usually if there's four women, that's deemed to be enough. Job done. If there's one of you on a panel <laughs> show, <laughs> you must have snuck in dressed up as a man. I mean, you know. It, yeah. But, OK, so 16. And were you aware? I mean, obviously, you were aware that there was a kind of... Uh, an attitude because the guy wouldn't sell the, you the records but who was it that encouraged you to say look forget it doesn't matter if they don't agree with you it doesn't matter if they don't want you do go for it anyway what was it I that... didn't think it was because I was a girl this is the thing when when I was in a girl band we had one boy which was my brother and whenever we got uh, flack from people or were, were treated badly, he used to say, he used to say, it's because we're girls, right? So he was a feminist, but and we used to think it was hilarious. We used to take the mick out of him for it. Because we were like, no, don't be daft. Because in my head, I was Iggy Pop. You know what? I didn't really think about being a girl. I was walking around pretending to be Iggy Pop. I wasn't thinking like, oh, I'm being a girl now. I mean, you, you know, it's that thing of the lenses other people see you through. I think it's James Baldwin talks about that. You don't see out of that. You know, you, you're, you're just you. So it wasn't until I got kind of a lot older and hopefully a bit wiser and thought, oh no, hang on, that's what was going on. I didn't realise that dynamic was there, but it was there all the time. And, and that's when you, you kind of start to think, well, where are those people who were, were chucked out of that guitar shop or, you know, told they couldn't play a gig and then just went, oh, this isn't for me, then I'll go and, yes. I'll go and do something else. I heard a really sad story about somebody who worked here, actually, and she took her guitar to university <laughs> thinking she'd be able to join in lots of bands. So she couldn't get one... Bo- group of boys to have her in her band in the band at all and I suddenly realized that's why you get all those girls playing the guitars on their own because mm. they're not allowed to join <laughs> bands <laughs> well they're the ones getting signed the so I mean that. you know and, and again that's the thing people say but look at the female solo artist you know who's selling records now and it's Adele and it's this and Adele is great you know she's fantastic and, and Laura Marlin is wonderful and there are loads of brilliant female singer-songwriters but who owns the record companies who's really making the money and, and that is not the same picture, and, th- and it's really dry and really boring, but that's the stuff that you've got to look at. It's not the kind of shiny who's on stage sh- stuff. It's who's making the decisions yeah. and who's making the money. Who's telling the story? Who who's in charge the of the story? Yeah. Who's the CEO, you know? But you obviously had parents, or, um, I think you told me particularly your mother, who kind of championed the idea of your energy. Is that right? Yes. Um, yeah, no, I mean, my m- mum is... Uh, she still is, you know, she's incredibly supportive. She's um, emotionally supportive and really practically supportive. You know, she, her and, and my dad both are, and they look, looked after my boys tons of times. So, you know, every time I'm at Glastonbury, they're there with my husband, usually looking after um, my sons so I can work. Yeah. But when you were growing up, you know, you were saying earlier that um, you had images of women, that you had images of your 
your nuns who are not sure that the you nuns. were that keen on it at the time, yeah. uh, but you know, women who de- who would determine that you would get educated. Well, it's funny. The miners' strike women. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was a sort of funny time, really, I suppose, the 80s and 90s when I was growing up and I was at school, because on the one hand, in the northeast, you know, it was this um, really hard time, and, you know, my dad's dad was a miner, my mum's dad worked in the shipyards, and the miners' strike was on, and the shipyards were closing down. It's this very sad kind of politicized time but but that kind of made people into activists who otherwise wouldn't have been you know there was the great film pride recently which which showed that story and and what i loved about that i, I mean i loved the story of the the lgbt activists you know raising money for the miners that was wonderful but i loved the mom in it you know the young mom who ended up spoiler becoming an mp and and just becoming really radicalized so um, the only time my mum ever left us was to go to Greenham Common, you know, and protest at Greenham Common. And I remember teaching my dad to make Yorkshire puddings that weekend because <laughs> I, I would have been about uh, four or five or something and he didn't know how to do it. And he made the Sunday dinner every week from then on. Um, so it was this funny sort of time where that was happening. And then, you know, the, the kind of uh, the school for clever girls in, in the area was, was a convent school. And at the time, I thought that uh, that was a very kind of oppressive environment to be in, and I hated it, and I, I didn't have a good time at school. I wasn't, um, you know, it, it definitely wasn't a cool thing to, to like uh, alternative music at my school. You were, you were weird, and, and people didn't like it. Um, but actually, much later, I was talking to a, a journalist, and she said, yeah, but you were surrounded by all these examples of single women who expected you to be clever, get on with it, and achieve excellence. And, you know, that's, that's what we did at school, and I thought, She's absolutely right. It's, the, it's not like leaving the dogma aside. I had some fantastic examples of empowered women. And I think, you know, it's not something that people would say often about the, the you know, nuns. You sort of think, well, these are women who somehow wanted to be priests and, and weren't allowed. But actually, they, they just expected us to, to be top flight, to, you know, achieve. And we did. So that's not to say that I agree with you know, all the things that we were taught and all the experiences were great, but actually that kind of practical example of women just getting stuff done was, Mm -hmm. I think, really useful. You you sort of said earlier that you thought you were Iggy Pop and you, you know, and I think a lot (laughs) of... I still have days, to be honest, (laughs) doing what I think. I might be. Uh, And we, I mean, I think most people would know that, like, you don't necessarily think you're a girl or a woman, I mean, you know you are one, obviously, but it, you, know, you don't expect to take up the kind of flag for being a girl or a woman. Yeah. You just think you're going to have your life. Yeah. And there comes a moment, maybe, it certainly did for me, or I think you have for you, when you suddenly think, oh, there really is actually an issue yeah. about equality. And I am a woman, and I've experienced it, and I, now I'm going to talk about it. Yeah. So, well, the glass ceiling doesn't look like it's there until you hit it. You know, it's, it, it's, everything's, everything's groovy when you're, you're 22 and, you know, you can work all day and that's not a problem. And, you know, you can stay late at the office. So you can, that's, that's, that's fine. You know, you start off in this, this career and it's all, it's all brilliant. And then, you know, you have a baby and soon it's like, bang, what are you going to do? You know, you've got to pick that uh, child up or you've got to find them childcare. And, and you know, you just... You, you notice those things when you come into contact with them. It's natural, isn't it? So, I mean, I think that's just the way it's so, I mean, Obviously, there are, you know, there, are other, there are glass ceilings that people have of different kinds, depending on their life experience. But when you hit the glass ceiling, and you obviously hit it in your own domestic circumstances, just because of the, the normality of domestic life, but did you decide that you were then going to start talking about it because in a public space a lot of women choose to avoid you know being if you like a a woman who calls out misogyny or calls out sexism but you actually are are bold and you talk about it I mean I definitely uh, feel like I have a responsibility to tell the truth if someone asks me a question I want to answer honestly but I also feel a responsibility to just get on with it. I kind of feel like I just want to make an alternative. So um, 
you know, I've had some great experiences in my career and I'm really lucky because I have a supportive husband. He is looking after our kids now, you know, that's, that's where they are. He looks after them so that I can do this. So actually, I'm quite a weirdly traditional setup, you know. He looks after them, I go to work. But that doesn't, you know, that doesn't mean that it's, it's not that easy for, for everyone. It's hardly that easy for anyone. We're incredibly lucky to, to have that um, possibility, to have that as a possibility in our lives. Um, but for me, I feel like I want to kind of uh, try and create something new. So instead of just complaining about the way things are, to create an alternative. So, um, you know, I've started a new business with my friend Sam, who's been an incredible mentor to me, Sam Baker, who's my editor at Red Magazine. She's now my business partner. And, you know, we've set up a new um, digital project called A Pool. Um, and it's an all-female office, which is a first for me. It's a completely different environment from anything I've ever worked in. You know, we've been developing it for two years. And so I just kind of want to, want to try and create the kind of company that, you know, I wish I could have worked in maybe when I was 25. I mean, I work in some great places. Six Music is, is an example of great practice as far as all that's concerned, I think. But going forward, I just kind of thought, you know what, I want to, I want to try and make a difference in terms of give some talented people a chance and try and give them a, a fair crack at the whip and a, and a good workplace. So that's what we're trying to do. So, I mean, being a role model for other women and being an opportun- somebody who's had opportunities, found opportunities, and you're going to make other opportunities for girls that come next. Is that the idea? Yeah, um, uh, very, very much so. You know, um, we've got a really talented team of contributors and we want to kind of... Uh, provide opportunities for for women to get their to get their voices out there and and make great work because it's you know it's like I said earlier it's there should there's there are tons of us there are tons of brilliant female writers and bloggers and and broadcasters and I just kind of want I want more diversity and and more of us on screen and online and and just everywhere really I want to kind of claim our half of the world it I, I don't We'll come back to claiming half the world minute. That's a fantastic phrase. Not just phrase. for me, but, you know, yeah. I mean, for, for all of us. The, 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 the classical music space for women is also you know, horrific in all kinds of ways. You know, when Marin Alsop was the first woman to conduct the last night at the proms, we had uh, male conductors around the world saying, well, women can't really conduct. Um, and some of them ran conservatoires. When we had one of the most experienced and phenomenal Korean composers, woman here recently... One of the ambassadors, I won't name him, asked her afterwards, did she write every note herself? Uh, I mean, so, you know, it, it, it operates in lots of spaces. And recently, when women got together to, as women in classical music, they also, though, were quite attacked for, you know, for needing to talk, needing to look after each other. Mm-hmm. And is that going to be the case for you? Do you think that the music industry, you said it was misogynist when you started off, do you think that there's going to be any kind of backlash at the idea of women standing up for themselves in the music industry? Um, I think there's always a bit of a backlash for, for women who stand up for themselves anywhere. You know, it's an it's a interesting landscape at the moment, the feminist one, because it seems to me like um, we are addressing absolutely critical, urgent inequality and, you know, life-threatening need in some places... And then in other places, we've got these issues which are kind of structural and they can wait, but they're still really important. And I feel like there's the urgent and there's the important. And it's, imp- it's obviously vital to, to not lose the important just because you're focusing on the urgent all the time. So it might seem like a bit of a kind of, I don't know, a lovey thing to, to worry about, but this is my patch and I feel like I want to I wanna make it fairer and... You know, I've, I've always tried to encourage other young female broadcasters coming up behind me because when I was younger, I didn't ha- always have that experience. Yeah. You know, I, did, I, I, I didn't always have somebody who could go, just give it a go, you know, give it a whirl. It's, it's going to be all right. I, I have as I've got older. And there have been some fantastic women who've really encouraged me on my way. You know, Joe Wiley, who is a, a friend of mine and a colleague of mine. Um, has been a fantastic support, particularly after I had my kids. And I, I, I kind of don't know how she's managed to juggle everything that she has. So some days when I'm having a, a tough day, I just think, well, you know, I think of Joe and think it's going to be all right. Just somehow it can be done, somehow. Yeah. 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 So I think, you know, there's always pushback, isn't there, when, when you try something new. 
Um, I, don't, I don't think... It's not that, a reason not to do it. No, and I don't think that... I mean, of course, there are huge, horrific problems in the world, but every single problem of inequality is linked. And if you let a girl feel that she's not allowed to realise her potential as a musician in one place, that's, that's almost identical to telling her in another place that she's not allowed to read a book or write a book or, you know, or choose her own husband or whatever. So they are all really the same story about yeah. inequality, as you say, and it's That's sort of so structural. And so I, I think, you know, completely think it's great when somebody like you, who's found their way in, you know, via Iggy Pop, pop fantasy or whatever, <laughs> but found their way into a place of influence and done what a lot of women haven't maybe had the feelings to do or courage to do, which is say, right, now I'm going to make it possible for the next generation. Do you know what I think, actually, uh, we were talking a little bit about that, I think is, is probably really important to bring in here, is um, I think we're all, as girls, given a really strong message that the sequence of things that happens is that you become perfect and that then you can start to achieve things. So it's like you have the transformation moment, you have the, the Cinderella moment or whatever it is, and you're in the night, you're the right dress with the right hair and the right guy, and then, then life starts to get good. And my experience um, in work has been that, the opposite of that. It's like, try things, keep trying, give something a whirl, fail spectacularly, give something else a whirl, it works out, keep going, keep pushing, and don't wait to be perfect because then, you know, you'll just, you'll just, you'll die, like, without doing anything. <laughs> Eventually, we're all mortal. And, and also, like, imperfection is where all the fun is. You know, I think I'm very lucky that I'm, I'm kind of from part of an, uh, an alternative culture, in, in the case of alternative music, where um, that's absolutely celebrated. You know, weirdness is a good thing. Being different is a good thing. And so you can kind of find a lot of support in that. Um, and it's, that's, that's the freedom. That's where you, you will find your own freedom is stop expecting yourself to get everything right. And, and I think, you know, as feminists, we can be very hard on, on other women and other feminists who aren't saying things in exactly the way that we would like them to say and, and they're not saying the thing that we want them to say at that particular time. And, you know, my friend, Catelyn Moran, she says, and I think she's right, feminism is this, it's like a quilt, you know, and we all make this, if we can all make a square then we can make something absolutely incredible. But if we wait for one woman to come and, and one perfect woman to come and solve the whole thing, we are just going to wait forever. So it's, it's got to be about a allowing for imperfection because, you know, as well as being women, we're all human. And that's what human beings are, spectacularly imperfect. Now, didn't I just say that earlier? I did, didn't I? I said to all the people being mentored, don't forget you're totally imperfect. I <laughs> wanted to make sure. <laughs> well, listen, that was... Uh, not perfect, because that would be hubris to say that it was a perfect interview, <laughs> it perfect. but it was damn near a perfect interview, wasn't it? Lauren Laverne. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.